the idea that history is only about the past is a very narrow uh, conception of history. I think that history is the study of change, not the study of the past. And we study the past not in order, not for the sake of to remember past events, mm -hmm. but in order to better understand our present condition and the future possibilities that we are facing. And in this history, it's just like you know other other um, disciplines like economics, that basically economists are also historians. I mean, all the data of economists, or most of the data, comes from studying the past. Like you study the previous financial crisis in, in history, such as the 1929 financial crisis, or the dot-com bubble of 2000, and you try to learn from that about the nature of economic crisis in general, so that the next time there is an economic crisis, you have a better understanding of what's happening and what can we do and what are the possibilities. And the historians are doing the same thing just on a broader scale. We don't just focus on economics. We try to understand change in general. We, the, the real subject of history is how humanity changes, how human society changes. And this involves not just economics, but the, 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 the connections between technology and economics and culture and religion and politics, everything together. Humanism, in essence, is the belief that the highest source of authority in the world is uh, human feelings, and the free choices, the free will of individual humans. And this is what democracy is built on, this is what the free market is built on, the customer is always right. The free will of the customer is the highest authority in economics. The free will of the voter is the highest authority in politics. This is the humanist idea. And it's, it's, it's all based on an outdated understanding of feelings and, and, and choices. It's, um, and for, you know, for, for centuries, we didn't have a better understanding of human beings and how humans make choices. So even though this was always a mythology, it was never true that humans have free will, uh, for all practical purposes, it made sense to act as if humans make choices freely. Because nobody could understand, you didn't have the biological knowledge and you didn't have the computing power necessary to really understand how humans make decisions, what humans feel, what humans think. Even if somebody like the KGB followed you around all the time, all the day, and watched everything you do, they didn't have the biological knowledge and the computing power to understand what was happening inside you. They couldn't understand how you think and feel. But now we are facing a tremendous revolution resulting from the merger, the, the confluence of two scientific revolutions. We have a revolution in biology. We have a better and better understanding of how the human body and especially the human brain functions. We are deciphering the human organism. And at the same time, we have a revolution in computing, in computer science, and we are gaining enormous computing power, and we are gaining the powers of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And when you put the two together, we are close to the point when we can have a computer algorithm analyzing the data about a person, especially biometric data, to such an extent that uh, it can understand how this person feels, what this person th thinks, and can predict and manipulate and make choices on behalf of that person. For the first time in history, we are approaching a point when an external system can understand me better than I understand myself. And once we reach that point, then institutions like free markets and democratic elections no longer make sense. Because an external system 
can not just understand me, it can also manipulate me. Um, without my understand, without my my understanding of what is happening, and and this is the this is the crisis, I think, the big crisis, I think, of 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 humanism, and we are going to see more and more the authority to make decisions in the world shifting from voters and customers and individuals shifting to algorithms that understand people better than the people understand themselves. Initially, it's humans who control the system that manipulates you. It's humans who write the algorithms and who use the algorithms maybe to manipulate you, to sell you something, to make you vote for somebody. But in the long term, even these humans will lose their power because the algorithms will become so complicated and so powerful that even the people who initially created them can't really understand what is happening. Uh, to take a concrete example, more and more banks are now giving the authority to decide uh, loans and mortgages to algorithms. You apply to a bank to receive a mortgage and previously your application goes to a human banker who goes over the information and decides. Now it goes to an algorithm that goes over immense amount of information and says yes or no. And the algorithm becomes so complicated and goes over so much data that no human is able to understand how the algorithm reaches a decision. The, uh, the whole idea of machine learning today and, and no, what is known as no, neural networks in artificial intelligence is that algorithms can recognize patterns that humans can't. And when it comes to banking, it means that algorithms can just by going over immense amounts of data they can recognize a pattern of people who don't repay their loans when humans can't. And what is likely to happen is that the banks will increasingly trust these algorithms to make decisions without the human bankers understanding why the algorithm reached this particular decision. So you apply to the bank, the bank says, no, we don't give you a mortgage, we don't want to give you money, and you ask why not, and the bank says, the algorithm said no. And you ask, why not? What's wrong with me? And the bank says, we don't know. We just trust the algorithm. So this is a concrete example, which we are likely to see in more and more situations, when even the people who control the system, like the bankers, they don't understand. They just trust the algorithms. In the stock market, decisions to buy or not to buy a stock, and in things like security, now you have people being identified as terrorists by an algorithm based on recognizing patterns. And it's not that you have solid information. You have an agent inside ISIS saying this person is a terrorist. No, you have an algorithm going over data from drones and from uh, uh, all kinds of surveillance system. And based on that data, the algorithm concludes this person is a terrorist and the NSA or whatever, they just believe the algorithm. And there are cases when people are identified as terrorists just by an algorithm, which we increasingly can't really understand how the algorithm reached this conclusion. The miss is that the real power of AI manifests itself only in combination with, with, the, with biotech. Because the really powerful AI, what, what really gives AI power is the power to understand humans. But to understand humans, you must have also biotech. You must have biometric data, biometric sensors. You must have some model of how humans function and make decisions and, and, and so forth. And this comes from, from, from biotech. If we didn't have the revolution in the biological sciences, so the ability of AI to understand human beings would be far, uh, far reduced. I mean, to give just a, again, a concrete example, just yesterday there was a big 
scandal uh, when there was this um, new research from Stanford about a new AI program that allegedly, according to the research, can identify the sexual orientation of people just by analyzing their face. They say they have almost a 90% success in, 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 in distinguishing gay men from straight men just by looking at a single picture. Or, or maybe it was three pictures, I don't, just a few pictures. And I, I don't want to go into the control. I mean, the, 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 there are all kinds of problems with the, with, the, um, uh, with the experiment, but at least according to the publication, they took images from dating sites of people who self-identify. I publish a profile on a gay dating site or on a straight dating site, so I guess you can trust the person that he really wants to meet men and, and not women. And you just take the, the, the picture that the person puts on, on the dating site. And now you give me the two pictures. Here are pictures of two men. You, we don't tell you which we took from a gay dating site and which from a straight. I usually can't guess. But the AI, at least according to the research, with a very high success rate of up to 90%, it can do it. Now, this is, this is ultimately, this is also based on biotech. It's understanding the human body. It's understanding how human sexuality functions. It's not just computers, it's organisms. Um, if humans, if we did not understand the human body, you couldn't do such, uh, you cannot build such an, an AI. And it's not a coincidence that people realize how frightening the situation is only when you have this kind of, of, of muting of the computing power and the body. Then people, oh, yeah. so we have computers that are able to, uh, to recognize some very deep biological characteristic like sexual orientation, and this, this, is, this is frightening. And, you know, I'm a, as a gay man, I know that for years I didn't know about my own sexuality. But I guess that, you know, I try to remember myself as a 15-year-old uh, teenager back in the 1980s. I guess that if an AI, uh, if they just, sh when I was 15, I didn't know I was gay. But I'm absolutely certain that if they, if they had an AI that just observe the way that I look at boys and girls in school, the AI would immediately recognize he's gay <laughs> for me. Now, what does it mean? I mean, I try to think about myself today. Let's say you open, a, you open a, a, an internet site based on this kind of, of software, and a teenager who is unsure about his sexual identity can go on this web page, and within five minutes, the web page tells you, hey, you're gay. <laughs> and, you the <laughs> and, I, and you can take it to all kinds of, 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 of frightening yeah. directions. But just stay with, with, with the, I mean, what took me years to understand about myself may now be possible, you know, two minutes on the internet and a, a, a good AI, and that's it. Uh, that your identity is, 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 uh, is determined. Well, it's a technical problem in the sense that for most of history, people thought that death was a kind of metaphysical problem. We die because God said so, or because the universe said so, and the only way to overcome death. And you had a lot of epics and mythologies about people trying to overcome death. And the way to do it was by some kind of great metaphysical gesture, like uh, you have the Epic of Gilgamesh from thousands of years ago about the great hero Gilgamesh who goes to on, on a search for how to overcome death. And you have, you know, the basic mythology, for instance, of Christianity that tells you the, the, the solution to death is Christ. You believe in Christ and Christ will uh, overcome death for you. And now you have the scientific establishment and more and more private corporations saying, no, death is not a metaphysical problem, it's a technical problem, in the sense that people don't die because God said so. People always die because of a technical problem in their body, like the heart stops pumping blood and you die. And every technical solution has a technical, every technical problem has, in principle, a technical solution. 
we can give you a medicine, we can give an electric shock to the, to the heart, we can replace the heart and give you a new heart we took from somebody else. We can even maybe in the future create an artificial bionic heart and replace your organic heart. Um, they are finding billions of believers uh, already today. I mean, the, the basic belief of this new religion is that algorithms know better than humans. And in more and more fields, that, I mean, if, again, if you collect enough data and you have enough computing power, you can build algorithms that can decide for us on things like what to eat, where to drive, what to study, whom to marry, uh, where, to, where to work, and all kinds of things like that. And it's succeeding. Yeah, I mean, you see that people are giving up, are trusting these algorithms in more and more fields. So, you know, it starts with things like uh, many people today lost the ability to navigate around the city because they just have a smartphone. You want to get from here to the central bus station or to the central train station. So you just follow whatever the smartphone is saying and you lose the ability to find your own way around space. Now, I'm not saying it's all bad. There are wonderful things coming out of, 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 this, of these new abilities. Uh, but when you look at the big picture, what you see is a shift in authority from humans, from human feelings, from uh, uh, human intuition, to the calculations of big data algorithms. I don't think we can stop technological progress in a broad field like the Internet of Things or like artificial intelligence. You can stop particular projects or particular inventions, but you can't, you can't stop an entire field. And um, however, it doesn't mean that technology is deterministic. You can use the same technology for very different purposes. Um, so I think the key question shouldn't be whether to stop all research in the Internet of Things. The key question is how to direct research in this field towards more responsible and, and beneficial goals. For example, um, there is now a growing concern with security. That in the early days of the Internet, there was very little concern about security. Everybody had this utopian vision that the Internet will be uh, free and it will bring harmony and democracy and so we don't need to worry so much about security and now it's especially with the Internet of Things it's an enormous problem because suddenly you can have hackers that take control of your car of your pacemaker of your toaster in the kitchen and start doing things so um, we need to shift a lot more attention to not just to, to how to uh, expand the Internet of Things, but how to make it secure. And similarly, there were a lot of issues about privacy. How to make sure that the Internet of Things doesn't turn into some kind of Orwellian surveillance system that follows everybody 24 hours a day and completely annihilates privacy. conclusion is, yes, we are becoming gods in the sense that we acquire divine abilities of creation and destruction, but we are becoming very irresponsible gods. We have the power, we create the power, we don't really know how to use it responsibly. So I think, yes, humans are becoming gods, but they are becoming very irresponsible gods. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>